was born in Bethlehem. Shepherds declared that angels announced his birth. Now that caused a stir. When men came asking, where is he that is born king of the Jews? We've seen his star and have come to worship him. Herod was filled with wrath. The babe is now a man, teaching a new doctrine with compassion and authority. The people are following him. The chief priests and elders are outraged. There's a mob outside of Pilate's Hall today. Something's happening. Something's happening in Pilate's Hall. On the porch, Pilate pleads with an angry mob in this man. I can find no fall. Something's happening in Pilate's Hall. I watched as his beaten, disfigured body fell beneath the load of the cross. His mother ran to him. Soldiers pushed her away. I heard the hammer fall, and I knew the nails had been driven, and he was on the cross. The scoffers kept chanting. I heard him speak words of forgiveness. There was darkness over the earth and a great earthquake. Then I heard him cry from the cross, it is finished. We watched him die, but somewhere deep within my being I knew this was not over.
If we could ever state in the English language that Christ the Lord is risen today. And it's true on Saturday as well as Sunday. Amen? Amen. Let's sing it together. Hello. Tonight is my pleasure to baptize Liz and Will Larson, and we're going to hear from Liz. I was raised in the Catholic Church. I always believed in God, but didn't follow the teachings in the Bible or attend church on a regular basis. I usually attend a church only during Christmas and Easter seasons. I had told myself if I was a good person, that was enough. It wasn't until our son, who attended Christian High School, asked to, us to attend Sunday services with him here at Shadow Mountain. At the first services, I felt God speak to me and knew I needed to make a change in my life. Since turning my life over to God and accepting Jesus Christ as my Savior, our family has been attending Shadow Mountain every week. I bought my first Bible, which I am reading, and have joined a small women's group, women's Bible study group. The ladies in the group have helped me on my path this past year, I have felt God's presence in my life. It has brought our family closer more than ever and strengthened the bond between my husband and myself. Today, I am here to proclaim to the world that I am a Christian and to follow the Lord in obedience and baptism. 
A Bible verse I want to share is Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. Amen. Liz, based on your testimony, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now we have Will. My first experience of God's love and grace came from my grandfather, a coal miner who was a Southern Baptist minister in the mountains of West Virginia. My family was always in church. Our lives depended on God's grace and goodness. My family and I left West Virginia when the coal mines closed and we moved to Florida, where at age 10, I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And as time went on, I grew distant from the church and found myself lost in my faith. That all changed when I started coming to Shadow Mountain Church, and I joined the weekly men's Bible study and was blessed to find a great group of men who had become my Christian brothers. They have reminded me to be a dangerous man of God. I can remember the moment when Jesus called me back through Dr. Jeremiah's sermon. He said, Jesus is waiting for you before he comes back. From that day, my life changed. I now feel Jesus' hands on me, and I know he's always with me. I'm here today to be baptized in obedience to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and declare I'm a Christian, and I will serve the Lord. I'd like to share with you Psalms 56.4. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Will, based on your testimony, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
blood still flows, the work is finished, and hell still knows that the grave is still empty, the soul is still rolled, and you're still high and lifted up, you're still seen.
shall always be my song of praise. And for here was grace that bought my liberty. I do not know just why he came to love me so. So I usually say this, he is risen. He is risen indeed. If you don't believe that after what you've been listening to and watching, there's really no hope I'm going to do any better. So <laughs> grateful to have you here for our Easter service. If you're a first-time guest, here's a special thing for you. Uh, and we swallow hard when we do this on Easter because we have lots of guests. But... Um, Go out to the patio. There's a, there's a guest table out there. They'll give you a free book, and with the free book are some vouchers that make it possible for you to eat dinner with us in our cafe tonight for free. It's an Easter gift just for coming to church. No strings attached. I hope you'll take advantage of it. It'll be fun. Over in another building tonight are a whole bunch of kids having the time of their life, getting the real message of Easter, but also... Uh, in every one of our services this weekend, we're distributing 10,000 eggs. I have no idea anything more about that than what I just said. <laughs> but if you, uh, if you haven't prepared for your kids to eat a lot of chocolate, you should probably do that because there's chocolate in those eggs, I think. <clears throat> in the 24th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, we have the first-hand account of what took place on that first Easter Sunday. It's just a few verses, but I'd like to read them. They'll be on the screen. You can follow along either on the screen or if you want to find your place in the Bible, Luke 24, verses 1 through 12. <clears throat> now, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepa prepared. 
But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, and they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered unto the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again? And they remembered his words, and then they returned from the tomb and told all of these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna, Mary the mother of James and the other women with them, who told these things to the apostles, and their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter... <laughs> He rose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen clothes lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. Some time ago, Newsweek magazine carried an article on the subject of the resurrection, and the article began with a reference to the scripture which I have just read to you, and this is what Newsweek had to say about it. As the Gospels tell it, the women and the men who stared at Jesus' empty tomb were not inclined to believe the good news. Frightened and scattered, fearful that they had been misled, the apostles themselves were slow to accept the idea of Christ's resurrection from the dead. And yet, just as Easter is the holiest day in the Christian year, so is the resurrection the deepest wellspring of Christian faith and hope. For if God can raise Jesus to everlasting life, mankind can also expect to dwell with him in heaven forever. Kenneth Woodward, who was the author of this article, put the importance of Easter in perfect perspective when he wrote, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the only hope we have of a future after death. Christ himself wrapped the two events in one sentence when he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I have to confess to you that I was a second-year student in seminary before I truly understood the centrality of the resurrection to the Christian gospel. I remember that Donna and I one night went to what they called a fellowship dinner that was being held in our community where uh, people could invite their friends who may not be Christians to come. They would have a nice dinner together and someone would present the gospel. That particular night, I remember, Haddon Robinson was the speaker. He was one of my teachers. And he gave a message at that friendship dinner in which he talked about the fact that the cross of Jesus Christ was not the central message of the gospel, but it was the resurrection. I was kind of shocked at first because I always knew the resurrection was important. I knew that we celebrated the resurrection far more than we celebrated the cross, but I wasn't really sure why. And I've discovered over the years that there are many people who have the same questions that we had because, you see, it's the resurrection of Jesus Christ that sets our faith apart from all other religions. What we celebrate at Easter is totally unique to Christianity. Let me be very clear about this. The foundation of our faith is not the teaching of Jesus Christ or the ideology that may have developed from his teaching. The foundation of our faith is not the Christian worldview, as important as that is. The foundation of our faith is not the wonderful life of Jesus with his compassionate miracles. The com the foundation of our faith is not even the death of Jesus Christ. All the religious leaders of the world have died. In that respect, Jesus Christ would be no different. The foundation of our faith is the well-established record of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said that he would die and that in three days he would come back from the grave. He did exactly what he said he would do. 
And it was that event that exploded into the hearts of the disciples and convinced them that this Jesus was who he had claimed to be, the only begotten Son of God. John S. Whale has said, the Gospels do not explain the resurrection. The resurrection explains the Gospel. <laughs> Belief in the resurrection is not an appendage to the Christian faith. It is the Christian faith. So what we are here tonight to celebrate is not just one of the things that we believe in our, in our Christian faith. It is the one thing we must believe or nothing else matters. The resurrection is at the core of everything that Christians claim to believe. In this Easter message that I have a few moments to give, I want to give you some reasons why the resurrection matters to all of us and why Easter is the most important holy day in all the year. Someone told me this week that Easter is the New Year's Day of the soul. Now, that's one to think about. First of all, the resurrection matters to Christ. Let's start by putting the focus on the person who is the star of this event, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. The resurrection matters to Christ, and it matters to him for at least three reasons. First of all, it matters because the resurrection vindicates his word. Listen carefully. On Easter morning, the angel said to the women at the tomb, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. The angels reminded the women that Jesus had told them what was going to happen. He had told them about his death, about his burial, and also about his resurrection. The women remembered Jesus' words. They recalled that Jesus had promised he would die and then he would be raised three days later. During his ministry, Jesus often predicted his death and resurrection. Once in a while, I hear critics of the Christian faith say, Jesus never said he was going to be resurrected from the grave. Well, don't ever say that to anybody because you just are demonstrating how ignorant you are because in the Bible over and over again, he told them what he was going to do. Let me just give you a couple of references from Matthew. Matthew 16, 21, from that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Jesus said that. A little bit later, we read in Matthew 17, now while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up. So why does this matter? Why does it matter that Jesus said that? Because if Jesus promised something that he didn't produce, then he's not worthy of anyone's faith. The resurrection is at the very core of the validity and credibility of the Savior. In his book on the resurrection, Stephen Mathewson drives the point home for us. He says, remember that Jesus has risen just as he said when you wonder if he's really with you as he promised. Remember that Jesus has risen just as he said when you doubt his promise that God will take care of your needs for food and clothing if you seek first his kingdom. Remember that Jesus has risen just as he said when you question the reality of his coming with power and great glory because Jesus rose from the death just as he said. We can trust all of his words and all of his promises. Jesus does not not keep his promises. He does what he says he will do. So the resurrection vindicates Christ's word, and the resurrection validates his work. Let me ask you a question. Listen carefully now. Think about this. Suppose Jesus had said, I am going to die and be buried and rise again the third day, and then he died, and nobody ever heard from him again. <laughs> Was his death on the cross meaningful? Of course not. The resurrection is what proves the reality of the crucifixion. This is what I got that night at that friendship dinner. 
Someone put it this way, the cross is Christ's payment of our debt. The resurrection is God's receipt for the full amount. <laughs> so you see, the resurrection is important to Christ because it validates his work. In fact, throughout the scripture, it's interesting, you hardly ever see uh, the, the crucifixion mentioned without the resurrection. When Paul was writing to the Roman believers in the eighth chapter of Romans, he said, it is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. I don't want you to forget those two verses, those two thoughts, they go together. And when Paul was explaining the gospel to the Corinthians, he gave them the best definition of the gospel you will ever see. Somebody ever asks you, what is the gospel? You take them to 1 Corinthians 15, because this is what it says. I declare to you the gospel that Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. The resurrection is a part of the gospel. It is the demonstration and proof that it is real. You can't have the gospel without all the parts. He died, he was buried, he rose again. There wouldn't be a good Friday without Easter because Christ would have long since been forgotten as just another martyr who died for what he believed in. But Easter, my friends, is what validates the work of Christ. We are here today to celebrate that Jesus Christ overcame death by his own power, came out of the grave, and stood with his hands up high, victorious over sin and the grave. No one has ever done that. No one ever will do that. He stands alone as the Savior of the world, demonstrated by his resurrection from the dead. <clears throat> Thirdly, the resurrection not only vindicates his word and validates his work, it verifies his worth. If the crucifixion had marked the end of his story, Jesus would undoubtedly still have been remembered as one of the greatest men to have ever walked on this earth. He was a captivating leader who amassed a devoted following, and those who loved him, the women who lovingly embalmed him, Joseph who offered up his own tomb for him, Nicodemus who assisted in the process, and countless others, they would have all been glad that they had been a part of treating someone they loved with such devotion. But when Jesus came out of the grave, bringing with him power over death, he became more than a memory. This event proved that he was indeed the Son of God. Romans says, Jesus Christ, our Lord, was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. How do you know that Jesus Christ was the Son of God? Because he came out of the grave victorious over death. If the cross is all there is to Jesus, he is just a martyr. But if the resurrection is true, then he's the Savior of the world, and he's the one in whom we put our trust. Arnold, Arnold Toynbee was perhaps the world's most read and translated and discussed scholar of his lifetime. If you go to seminary or even in secular educational programs, you may have to read the histories written by Arnold Toynbee. He wrote a book and called it A Study of History, published in 1934. And in that book, he wrote a chapter devoted entirely to saviors of in, in the world. Now, in that chapter, he said there are four different kind of saviors. <laughs> First of all, there's the savior with the scepter, the political savior. Then there's the savior with the book, the philosopher, the teacher, the theologian. Then there's the savior with the sword, the military savior. And finally, there's the man-god or the god-man savior of Greek theology. Toynbee points out <clears throat> that each of these savior types ultimately capitulate to the great enemy of death. Politicians and kings and military leaders and philosophers, they all die. And then he concludes his chapter with these words. When the last civilization shall have come to the river of death, there on the other side, filling the whole horizon with himself, will be Jesus Christ the Savior, for he alone has overcome the grave. Amen. <laughs> 
In the mind of the great historian, there's only one Savior who's qualified to save, for he has conquered death. So first of all, the resurrection, resurrection matters to Christ. But let me get a little on the other side of the page here and talk to you about the fact that the resurrection matters to critics. As you can well imagine, critics of the faith, critics of Christianity, go hard at the resurrection. Because if they could disprove the resurrection, they have, they have uh, brought Christianity to its knees. They've destroyed it. The resurrection of Christ has always been met with criticism because it stands at the cornerstone of the Christian faith. Skeptics try to discredit the miraculous event by questioning why the tomb was found empty on the first Easter morning. I have been reading about this and studying about this for almost 50 years. And it is such an interesting thing to me to see how much faith you have to have to believe what they think happened. Way more faith than just believe what the Bible says. They offer so many explanations and theories. And let's just take a couple of them and think about what they said was going on. First of all, um, they said that maybe Jesus was confused because the women went to the wrong tomb. <laughs> According to this theory, the women who discovered that Jesus' body was missing had simply gone to the incorrect tomb by mistake. But the Jewish leaders who were on, who were set on disproving the resurrection, all they would have to do is go to the correct tomb and produce Jesus' body, and they would shut everything down. But they didn't do that because it was, in fact, the correct tomb. It was just an empty tomb. Here's another thought some of them had to explain this. It's called the swoon theory. This is my favorite. <laughs> to swoon means to faint or lose consciousness. And according to this theory, the disciples mistakenly believed Jesus was resurrected when he was really just resuscitated. He didn't die. He was only unconscious when he was laid in the tomb. Consider what you have to believe in order to accept this theory. First, you have to believe that Jesus survived a six-hour crucifixion, and then you have to believe that he somehow managed to survive for three days in the coldness of a tomb, and then you have to believe that despite his weakened state, he was able to move a large boulder blocking the entrance of his grave. And finally, you have to believe that he invaded the guard stationed at the tomb and convinced his disciples that he had a glorified body before disappearing into anonymity. He is risen. He is risen indeed. You don't need to believe that. Now, here's, here's a sinister. Here's, here's, the, here's the more sinister one. This is called the stolen body theory. <laughs> this idea proposes that the disciples took Jesus' body while the guards were asleep. This was an early rumor. In fact, it's even mentioned in the Scripture. Listen. When they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, Tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept, and this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed, and this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. In other words, that was a rumor that was going around even during the time of the resurrection. This is going to give the, the disciples a whole lot more credit than they deserve. They weren't exactly known for their courage. Do you remember? When Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Bible tells us that all his disciples forsook him and fled. <laughs> Not exactly the bravest guys who ever showed up. During our Lord's trial, Peter denied him three times, denied that he even knew the Lord Jesus. After the cruci crucifixion, the disciples hid themselves in an upper room and locked the doors. These same disciples were also skeptical when they first heard about the empty tomb, and one of them refused to believe unless he could personally touch the wounds of Jesus. Two disciples on the road to Emmaus doubted the reality of the risen Lord while they were at that very time talking to him <laughs> as they walked along the road. 
But after Easter morning, listen up, all of Jesus' disciples were willing to die as martyrs for preaching about his resurrection. It would be highly unlikely for them to sacrifice their lives for something they knew was a deceitful hoax. They knew what had happened. No one had stolen the body. Jesus didn't swoon. He had risen. Theologian Penenberg once said, the evidence for Jesus' resurrection, listen carefully to this, is so strong that nobody would question it except for two things. First, it is a very unusual event. And second, if you believe it happened, you got to change the way you live. That's why it's so critical, why it's so crucial. The resurrection says the gospel is true. The resurrection says Jesus died on the cross, that miraculously he came out of the grave, proving that he was the only one who could come to this earth and forgive our sin. You either believe that if you, or you don't. If you choose to believe it, some changes start happening in your life, as many of you know. So yes, the resurrection matters to Christ, matters to critics, and it matters to Christians. The resurrection guarantees a future hope. We, we live in a constant awareness of death. I'm sure most of you, as I did, watched the so sad ceremony in New York today of the policeman who was killed this week. So many people gathered there to mourn his death. Seems like every day we have something like that happening in our country. Death is never far from us. And we all know that we're on the list. We don't know where we are, but we know we're on the list. But we don't have to be afraid of that. 1 Corinthians 15 says, If Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, and you're still in your sins. And those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Do you see what Paul did? He rested his entire hope of the future life on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He said, if Jesus Christ did not come out of the grave, then the people who have died in Christ are still in their sins and there's no hope. We may not want to admit it, but we all share the same fate, death. The statistics don't lie, and it's a mature person who faces the reality head on. But here's the amazing thing. And this is true, really true. Those of us who have met the risen Christ, who have accepted Christ as our personal Savior, as those people testified in the baptistry today, no longer have to fear death because death is just a transition to the next life. Christians have a great perspective on death. We don't want to die, and we all fight to live with all our might. But when we have the hope of Jesus within us, we are not afraid to face death because we know what lies beyond. Here is how one pastor described what lies ahead for those who believe in Jesus. He said, the resurrection of Christ offers something unparalleled. While other religions may promise spiritual afterlife or bliss, they only offer solace for what has been lost. But in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is the promise of restoration. It's not just about getting your life back. It's about living the life you've always wanted but never experienced. Through Jesus Christ, we can have confidence that we will lack nothing in the future, nothing. It's all coming in the future, and it's going to be unimaginably wonderful. God has got our future when we receive Jesus Christ. And yes, we all face we sorrow not as others who have no hope. We sorrow, but it's so different when you know Jesus, who said, I am the resurrection and the life, and he who believes in me shall never die. So Christ's resurrection guarantees a future hope, but it's not just about the future. This is not pie in the sky by and by. The resurrection has a meaning for all of us. Uh, this week, we went through the scriptures in the New Testament and found 15 different references to the resurrection and how it affects us in our life today. Obviously, I don't have time in an Easter sermon for 15 points, so I'm not going to share those with you, but I've always loved the short stories that I had to study as an English major, and one of my favorite writers has been Hans Christian Andersen. 
Some of you have read some of those short stories. Here's an, an interesting story that illustrates what I've been talking to you about today. It was Sunday morning, and the sun was shining brightly, bringing warmth into the living room. Outside, under God's blue sky, where the meadow was green and fragrant with flowers, the birds were rejoicing. But while there was joy and happiness outside, inside there was sorrow and gloom. Even the wife, who usually was such a cheerful person, sat this morning at the breakfast table and looked down sadly. She got up without hardly touching her food, and she dried her eyes and slowly headed for the door. It was as if a curse had come over this house like a black cloud. There was an economic depression in the land. Industry was down. Everything in the country seemed to be going backwards, except, of course, for taxes. In fact, taxes were becoming more and more of a problem. Sound familiar? The crops always seemed to be worse than the year before. And now there was nothing to look forward to but poverty and misery. And of course, all of this lay heavy on the man of the house, who was usually such a hardworking and upright citizen, but now he despaired at the very thought of the future. Whatever this cheerful wife said could not console him. Neither the secular or spiritual comfort of his friends made any difference. It made him even more silent and more depressed. It was no wonder that his poor wife was losing hope also. When the husband saw his wife so unhappy that she was about to leave, he stopped her and he said, I will not let you go out of this house until you tell me what is wrong. She was quiet for a moment and she sighed deeply and then said, last night I dreamt that God was dead and that all his angels followed him to the grave. And the man said, how can you imagine such nonsense? Don't you know that God could never die? Suddenly the face of the dear wife was filled with happiness and she squeezed his hand and she said, you mean the good God is still alive? And she embraced him and looked at him with eyes shining with faith and peace and joy and she said, since God is alive, why should we not believe in him and trust him? He who has counted each hair on our head who will not let one single hair fall outside of his will, he who clothes the lilies of the field and gives the sparrows and ravens their food. And as she spoke, it was as if the scales began to fall off of his eyes, as if the heavy bands around his heart were loosened. And for the first time in many days, he smiled. And he thanked his dear godly wife for the scheme she had come up with to rekindle his faith and give him back his trust in God. Do you see in the story that hope is everything? And hope is not just something that you think about. Hope has to be tied to a reality. And the reality of our hope is the risen Lord who has conquered the last enemy, which is death. So I say to you, the resurrection matters. It matters to Christ. It matters to the critics. It matters to Christians, and the question that we focus on in these last moments is this one. Does it matter to you? Donald Gray Barnhouse was a master at making complex ideas easy to understand. And during Easter vacation one year, <clears throat> there was a young lady in his congregation who was struggling with putting her faith in Christ. She said, I just, can't, I just don't have the faith. I just can't do it. So many people uh, think that you have to muster up your faith. You have to decide to believe in Christ, and that certainly involves faith. So Dr. Barnhouse was trying to help this young lady, and he said to her, young lady, how are you getting back to college? And she said, I'm going back on an airplane. He said, have you have your ticket yet? She said, no, I'm going to the airport today and talk with the people at the airline and get a ticket. Well, do you know the person at the ticket counter? No, I don't. And when you were going to get on the plane, do you know the pilot? Well, of course, she says, no, I don't know the pilot. So you're going to trust the word of someone you do not know to tell you where to go, 
and then you're going to trust someone that you do not know and will probably never see again to fly you there safely, and yet you cannot trust one of the great and most attested facts in history of the risen Lord and accept a Savior who has demonstrated his love for you. If what I have said today is true, and I know it is, the risen Christ is the very center of our world. He's the center of your world, even if you don't recognize it. And that means how we respond to him will determine what happens to us in the future and in many respects what happens to us now. It's not a blind leap. It's based upon the life and death of a man who conquered death itself. No one else has ever been able to do that. He stands victorious over an empty grave and offers you the opportunity to join him in triumphing over death. All you have to do is say yes. I will trust him. I will put my faith in him. I will let this risen Christ be my own personal Savior. And the person who does that today will spend eternity with the Father on the basis of God's holy word. Let's pray together. And now, Father, would you take your word, and as it has touched each of us in a different way, would you do your work in all of our hearts so that we don't waste this moment because it's an eternal moment for many of us. And I pray for all of those who are watching us on the Internet and across the nation and around the world that they will feel their presence here in this room with us and that as the Word of God has been spoken and the resurrection has been taught, they will come to faith in Christ today. If you have never trusted Christ, the risen Christ, as your own personal Savior, here's what you must do. You must invite him into your life. And you do that through a prayer. And let me help you with that prayer. Just pray in your heart after me. Pray it silently, quietly, but believingly. And just say, dear God, I believe that Jesus Christ is your son and that he came into this world to die for my sin, that he died and was buried and rose again the third day, victorious over the grave. And I believe in Jesus Christ as the risen Christ, and I accept him today as my personal Savior. Lord Jesus, forgive me for my sin and cleanse my heart and give me the life back that you wanted me to have in the beginning before sin entered. And help me to live for you for the rest of my life and bring honor and glory to your name. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for hearing my prayer today as I have accepted you into my life. And Father, as this prayer is prayed here and around the world, wherever this is being heard or seen, would you grant to these who have prayed this prayer an absolute certain faith and change their lives from the inside out is my prayer. If you're watching on television and you've prayed this prayer, there's a place where you can uh, indicate on the screen that you've prayed to receive Christ. We just want to know, and we'll be very grateful and thank God for it. And if you're in this room, you've prayed with me to receive Christ, and this is the first time you've ever done that, I want you to just lift your hand. Our, our eyes are closed. No one's looking around. But I'd like to see this. If, you, if you've prayed today to receive Christ, would you just lift your hand till I see it? Yes, I see it in the back, yes. All over the auditorium and, and in the balcony, Yes. And Father, we are so grateful. As we watch the baptisms today, we saw the joy that comes into the life of a person who receives Christ and follows through in his salvation. May this be the experience of everyone in this room who have so responded today. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand with me, please? We're going to sing Amazing Grace, not all the verses, just the first and the last. I wish we could get our trumpet guy up here to help us, but I think he's, he's in the back room. But um, as we sing this, if you want uh, some information, 
to help you in your walk with the Lord. You raise your hand. You can come down or wait until we're done singing and come down. And there will be staff members all across the front. If you have questions about your faith, if you're interested in your relationship with our church, if you're prepared to be baptized and you wonder why you've been waiting so long, someone's here to help you. And we want to make it convenient for you and we want you to have confidence to come and do it. So while everybody else is waiting to get out, just take a few moments and come down here and uh, talk to our friends. Let's sing together. Guys, can you lead us? Father, we ask your blessing upon us as we leave. Thank you for this holy day that brings us all together. And may we not forget that the reason for this day is so much more important than we would ever acknowledge if we did not understand the Bible. May we go from this place to live in newness of life because of what you have done for us in coming back from the grave. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. And once more, let us say this. He is risen. He is risen. Amen.